like looking at his lapel, and he's, he's trying to figure it out, and he says, no. <laughs> That's on, backwards, okay. <laughs> so Matthew chapter 2, we're in Matthew chapter 2 tonight. I, I do want to thank you for everyone that um, just obeyed the Lord, going to the blood mobile, those of you who obeyed the Lord in giving to the live stream uh, offering. And I know God didn't tell everybody to do that, and that's totally fine. Uh, we just ask that you just obey the Lord, whatever God tells you to do. And uh, we haven't got all the funds in, or at least well, we don't count the offering until Tuesday morning. But I think with the pledges and the offerings, um, I, I think we're going to be able to get the full system, the two-camera system, and it looks like that. So I'll let you know how that all turns out this week. But uh, our, our tech guy is ready to go. He says, I can't wait to get you guys up and live streaming. That's what he told me. That's a couple days ago, so we're excited to have somebody like that uh, working with us. Amen. God, God brought him. Matthew chapter 2. So, <clears throat> plans. Plans. I remember it's been a process. The Lord has been working uh, in my life the past few years, and one of the things He's really been working with in my life is and I can't speak for him necessarily, but I could say this, that God has been working out of me the desire to plan. And I don't mean not to be organized, not to have a vision moving forward, have some idea of where you think God would have you to go, um, but not to be a person that leans on my plans. And God has been systematically working that out of my life. The most recent one um, that he took me another step in that was honestly the fact that I'm standing here as your pastor tonight. I never would have planned that. Um, when I came here five years ago, I planned on being a youth pastor my entire life. That was my total goal. I had no desire to do that. And to this day, I still love our teens and love being up there with them. Um, but God started doing something in my heart a couple years ago that only he could have done. And, boy, I didn't think it was going to be here. I thought I was going to be going to Pennsylvania to train and, and become a pastor up there. I mean, miraculous, God have brought all that out. But, again, I started planning. And I thought, well, God must be doing this. I mean, the doors are open. God's working in my heart. I'm heading this direction. Little did I know God was doing all that, not so I would end up in Pennsylvania, but so I would be okay with ending up here. And that's God's plan. Here's the awesome thing about that. Um, to me it is that I stayed here. I don't know if it's to you that awesome, but it is awesome to me that I stayed here. But the best thing about that to me is that even though I thought it was going to go this way and God took it this way, I'm totally okay with that because that was God's plan. And although I didn't know it at the time and literally was walking at some points day by day because I didn't know what the next day was going to hold, it was all in God's plan. And now I can look back on it and see, wow, wow, glory to God. Glory to God, I'm so glad I didn't mess that plan up. And I'm so glad I didn't go off on my own, which I have done quite a few times, more than I wish to count in front of you. Matthew chapter 2, we see another part of the plan unfolding. And we're fortunate to look back 2,000 years ago how it all happened. They didn't have that privilege here. They're living right in it. We have several characters in Matthew chapter 2. You know, we, we ended uh, last week, I believe it was, if I'm getting my times right, uh, where Mary and Joseph were in the temple, remember? And Zach or, or Simeon and Anna were the ones that knew who Jesus was. They walk in, they knew who Jesus was, and we went through that whole thing. The reward for them was finding Jesus. The reward was Him. Amen? And we got, we got a bunch out of that. That was such a heart-fulfilling uh, heart message for me, and I appreciated your attention. Immediately following that, because we're going synon uh, chronologically through the Gospels, we immediately, before it goes to that final verse where after they left the temple, there's one more verse there and it says, and something like, um, I'm, I'm going to misquote it, so don't quote me, but something like, when all of, everything that had been according to the law was fulfilled, they went and they dwelt in Nazareth. But here's the cool thing about the Gospels. There was actually something that happened from the time that Anna stopped her conversation with Mary and Joseph about Jesus and the time that they ended up in Nazareth. And it's called Matthew chapter 2. It's an entire chapter about what happened in that time period. And this is just, just I, you know, I, I can't, I'll never comprehend the mind of God. But only God could have come up with four different men giving four different testimonies, four different angles about what happened. And it's the only spot in the Bible um, that is like this. And I have to believe it's because it's about God's Son. 
and he deserved four books, <laughs> repeating what he did. And the Bible says that even with those four books, we still just scratching the surface of what Jesus did while he was here on this earth. That's how awesome our God is. And so Matthew chapter 2, we continue uh, with the message I just titled tonight, It's All Part of the Plan. It's all part of the plan. Uh, man's plans fail. Man's plans get mixed up. Man's plans could seem rock solid one day, and they're just falling to pieces the next day. Matter of fact, we have an entire business sector in New York City called the Stock Exchange that bets daily on man's plans, how they're going to turn out. This business is going to go up, it's going to go down. This one's going to make a bunch of money, this one's not. And they're betting every day. Now, now they're betting like in nanoseconds with computers and everything. I don't even understand all that stuff. They had a pretty crazy week last week, I guess. That's man's plans. They're up, they're down, they're all over the place. Not so with God's plans. God's plans may have twists and turns, but here's the thing with God's plans. He already knew that twist was there, and he already knew that turn was there, and he knew the up was there and the down was there. He saw it all ahead of time, and we get to zero down on one chapter where he explains his plan. He explains his plan in Matthew chapter 2. See, man's plans may fail, but it's not so with God. When God lays out a strategy, it always succeeds. When God makes a promise, he always keeps that promise. When God formulates a plan, he is always able to fulfill that plan without fail. Without fail. Matter of fact, if God ever deviates from what he originally planned, it's only because he chose to deviate. It was never because his plan was foiled or somehow faulty or he didn't think of, oh, I didn't realize that was going to happen. Now I've got to change plans. Not so with God. Not so with God. Stormy times of life and culture, wickedness and culture, viruses, pandemics, fatal diseases, death, even genocide are not outside of God's plan. He already knew all of it. He knew all of it. And his plan still continues. The task of the believer, I was reminded this morning in Sunday school, is not really to take my life and see how God's plan fits in my life. The task of the believer is to find out the best I can where God is and where God is going and get there right beside him. Get there right behind him and follow his plan. Follow his mission. Because all of my plans, they really don't mean a hill of beans if they're not in accordance and not in submission with his plan. And I don't know about you, but I, I've gotten that backwards many times in my life. We get a bird's eye view of God's plan here in Matthew chapter 2. From the very beginning, we have um, some familiar men. Chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Wise men have now entered the scene. We're going to talk about them in a minute. To the very end, verse 23, it says, And he, Joseph, came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Jesus of Nazareth. We all know him by that throughout the scriptures. But a lot happens from verse 1 to verse 23. And it was all part of God's plan. All part of God's plan. God had laid out a plan here. We see it in Matthew 2. Drama, adventure, worship, anger, turmoil, destruction, and sadness could not stop this plan from coming to fruition, from this plan from happening. God's plans are perfect. God planned on sending his son to reveal himself to them and to you and I. Jesus said, if any man's seen me, he's seen the Father. God wants us to know him. And this was a major move on his part to make that happen. What is involved in God's plan? Well, in Matthew chapter 2, we're not going to read the whole chapter. We're going to go little by little because I'm not confident I can finish this in time tonight. So we'll stop it when we need to stop it. Brother Mike, you'd be proud of me. All right, point number one. <laughs> Unbelievers are part of his plan. Hmm, I had to think about that one. Unbelievers, this should be the first slide there, are part of God's plan. Let's, let's read Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we've seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. 
and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. But I could just see him saying that all syrupy and sweet. What a snake. What a snake. Uh, we're going to see his, his little plan. It didn't stand up to God's plan. It didn't stand up to God's plan. Why don't we ask the Lord to help us here as we study. Father, please be with our Bible studies. We look into your word. We need your eyes. We need your Holy Spirit to reveal the truth to us tonight. Lord, so that we can see that this is more than just a true account. And we're so grateful that it is. But it is another step in your plan. And please help us tonight, Lord, to see what you have taught me here, Lord. And I would ask you, Father, to take it even further. And I know you will, in your faithfulness, reveal truth to us and begin applying it to our hearts. Lord, just help your people tonight to be obedient. Whatever you tell us, Lord, that we would fall under the mighty hand of God. We would see your plan, see your direction in our lives, even if it just be a plan for tomorrow. Lord, and we would fall under that. We would make sure that everything that is in our life right now, all of our plans, all of our directions, all of our desires, Lord, fall under submission of Almighty God. Lord, tonight would be a night of cleansing if, if that needs to happen, Lord. Tonight may just need to be a time of redirecting. Lord, that we would get back following your steps the way that we should have been doing the whole time. Lord, thank you for your word. Please encourage our hearts tonight. Lord, there are some in this building that are going through difficult times. Physical, could be family problems, could be temptations, dealing with sin, that they're struggling with, Father. Maybe they've been out of work. I don't know what the situation is, but you do, Lord. We need you, Lord. Your name is a strong tower tonight. We run to you. We run to your protection. We lean on your strength. We cannot do this life without you, Lord. We dare not do this without you. Please be with us. In your name I ask. Amen. So we see unbelievers are part of his plan. Well, well, what do you mean? Well, verse number one, we're introduced to a few unbelievers. As far as we know, we are not given any, um, anywhere in the scriptures that they are believers. Um, but even if, even if by chance the wise men are believers, we have another very crucial unbeliever in this story as well, diametrically opposed to everything that's going on here. His name is, is Herod. But who were these wise men? I like to ask these questions and try to figure out. Matter of fact, when I'm studying for these, I, I just ask a list of questions that I want to have answered. Um, might have been like uh, Rich Johnson Ball <laughs> was doing something, except I don't write them all over the floor. <laughs> so, but, uh, but my desk almost looks like that. So um, I'm actually looking forward to segue here. Uh, <laughs> rabbit trail, I guess that's not a segue. To getting into the office just because the desk is bigger. I can spread more papers out on the desk. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so who were these wise men? Well, we know they came from the east, okay? And uh, we're going to show you a map in a minute. Not right, not right now, guys. But they came from the east, possibly Babylon. Now, this is an interesting theory. We don't know that for sure. But we do know this. 600 years prior to this, there was a young man that lived in Babylon, and his name was Daniel. And he was made the head of all the wise men, the magicians, the magi, the Chaldeans, as a matter of fact, he was there for almost 80 years. And it is entirely possible. Daniel, by the way, Daniel, seven, six or seven chapters of prophecy in the book of Daniel. It's entirely possible that these men had heard about the Jewish Messiah coming from Daniel. We don't know exactly where they came from, but we know they came. We know they came. Here's the interesting question. I don't know if you ever thought of this. Why did they see the star and nobody else did? I mean, did you ever think of that? I was just... I hadn't really until I studied this. I was like, yeah, why, why, did they, why did these guys see it? I mean, the people of God are right there in Israel, right? But some guys from a foreign land come over, and they've noticed this star. Well, what is it, like a private star? I mean, where, 
How come nobody else noticed a star? Stars are pretty visible in case you haven't noticed. How come these guys only? Pretty interesting questions, right? Why did they rec recognize the star? These men came, they announced that a star had appeared, and Herod didn't say, oh yeah, I saw that star too. It was just them. Unbelievers are a part of God's plan. He uses who he chooses to use, and we'll, we'll draw some conclusions to why that could be here as, as, this, as the account gets going. But they saw it, and as far as we know, they were the only ones that saw it, but they're definitely the only ones that came. They came to Jerusalem, the home of the king. That was a natural place to come. We go to Jerusalem and we ask. We saw a star. We, this, we have to believe. Um, I'm quoting them, not really, because I have no idea what they said, but we have to believe that... Um, that something special is happening here. As a matter of fact, they knew somehow that a king had been born. This is in verse 2. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? So they had some, they had some information here. And we don't know exactly where they got it. For we have seen his star in the east. Wow, nobody else saw that. But they did. And were come to worship him. Now, it says when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. Why was Herod troubled? I mean, if you hear of a uh, neighboring king, I mean, that's good news, right? I mean, lots of people are excited when a new king. It says Herod was troubled, and it says Jerusalem was troubled with him. Well, that to me is even more puzzling. I mean, King Herod, yeah, I can see why he was troubled. If you study in history, King Herod was notorious for jealousy of anyone that would compete for the throne. Matter of fact, John Phillips uh, is pretty good with Bible history, and he writes this. Herod filled Jerusalem with foreign mercenaries and the cities of Palestine with spies. No man or woman was safe while Herod reigned. One by one, he murdered every rival claimant to the throne. He stamped out the Hasmoneans. He murdered his wife's brother, a lad of 17, because he was popular with the Jews. He murdered Marianne, the beautiful Maccabean princess he had married, because he was suspicious of her. And he murdered both of her sons, Five days before his death, he murdered his son and future heir. Herod hacked and hewed his way through life, slaughtering six to 8,000 of the best people in his realm because he was suspicious. And by the way, all Jerusalem knew this. They had been there for all of this. They knew. Maybe the people were fearful that Herod would kill their Messiah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the people were just unsure what this psycho king was going to do now that he heard somebody else was laying, going to be laying claim to the throne. We don't know exactly, but we know that these wise men, God gave them something and brought them here for a purpose. Matter of fact, without that right there, in a human standpoint, obviously God would do whatever he wanted. From a human standpoint, if the wise men hadn't come, we wouldn't have got to verse 23. Okay, it would have been a different, different method, but God chose to use that one. God chose to use that method. So we see that Herod, he hears this, and he calls in the chief priests and scribes. He calls them in. And he wants to know, um, he wants to know, let's see, where are we at here? They said unto him, okay, verse 4, And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. He's making demands now. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet and they quote Micah 5, 2 here. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. They quoted scriptures that all of them had seen many times in Micah 5, 2. But I think it's very interesting that they were not the ones that came to King Herod and said, the king of the Jews has been born. It was people from out of town, not even, not even God's people. They come from out. They alone had seen this star. They alone that knew the king of the Jews, even though they didn't know who he was, the king of the Jews had been born. They knew the timing. The people with the Bible knew where. The people, as far as we know, with no Bible knew when. They knew when. Isn't it interesting how God puts all these things together? And he begins to unfold his plan. It says in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, so now he's getting sneaky. This is when the snake comes out. They inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. Okay, so I'm going to figure this out. Here, you guys with the news, now you know where, they know when, you come on out, when did that star appear? You guys are the only ones that saw it, when did it appear? And they tell them. They tell them. 
And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Only out-of-towners would have fallen for that. Please understand, these guys were intentionally brought by God. They're the only ones that this would have, all of these steps would have worked out this way. They didn't know Herod. They didn't know his ruthlessness. And they went believing what he said. I know they believed what he said because God had to tell them to go a different way when they were done. They were going to come right back and do what he said. That was their intention. They believed him. These foreigners, these unbelievers. They had been loyal to this wicked king and the culture he brought for too long. The Pharisees and the scribes, they weren't even looking for Jesus. So God brought in somebody that wasn't one of his. God brought in people that was not raised under the sound of the gospel, if you want to put it that way, believing in Jehovah God. And I, I see here a consistent theme that if God's people don't want to be used, God will use somebody else. God will use somebody else because God is not going to be stopped from his purposes just because we don't want to fall in line with his purposes. God doesn't change. And he, he wants to be known. He wants to be sought. We see that over and over again in the scriptures. But he doesn't wait for that to happen, to get on with his mission, his purpose. You know, this is, I'm sure it's not just an American philosophy, but I just see it all over America, and I'm a product of that. And I, I've struggled with it many times myself. This whole idea that it's really not about me. It's not about me um, getting this, you know, we take these verses that uh, God has these precious thoughts to you and God has a great plan for your life and all this, and those are all true things, but it's like that's the only part of him we say. All this positive thinking that we have to have, it's not about us. It's not about us, and God does not owe us any positive self-talk. What he owes us is really nothing. What we owe him is everything. And we have to keep that in mind. That's, that's not degrading. That's, that's not... Um, no, I'm not thinking of the word, so we're going to move on. Hey, how did, how did Herod want to know what time the star appeared? How was he going to figure that out? It says he inquired diligently of the wise men. I was, I was thinking of this. Why didn't Herod go to Bethlehem himself? I mean, why? He's the king. Why would he send these guys? Again, he's being deceitful here. He's being deceitful. He is formulating his own plan. And he's just deceived enough to think that this is going to work. This is going to work. Okay? So, point number one, God, uh, what was point number one? Unbelievers are part of his plan. Point number two, rewarding seekers is part of God's plan. Rewarding seekers. God rewards those that seek him. Let's look in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 9. When they had heard the king, this is the wise men, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Again, these guys are all by themselves. To me, if there was a star guiding, there would be like a crowd of people. It's very interesting that the star was guiding them alone. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Again, we have to ask the question, why did the star appear to them? We don't know why it appeared to them, but we do know this. We know they were looking. They were looking. I, I have, a, as I study the scriptures and... and I don't know. In two years, this may change in my mind as I get new information, as Brother Nick said this morning. But I don't think God is as hard to be found as we make it out to be. I really don't. I think we come up with all of these restrictions, and we, we make this box of what God uh, acts like and does and what he will do and won't do. And some of it's out of the Scripture, and some of it's just the way we see the Scripture, and some of it's what somebody else said about the Scripture, and some of it's this and that. Instead of just letting God be God. It has been, that has been pretty much the walk of my Christian life since I was 32 years old. 16 years and just letting God be God. Grew up in religion. Had all sorts of right and wrong applications. 
And quite honestly, after I got saved at 32 years of old, it took me a couple years to figure out which ones were right and which ones were wrong, because I really didn't know. I really didn't know. My head was a jumble at that point. I knew I was saved, but I didn't know what I was believing wrong and what I was believing right. The devil has done a masterful job at that, confusion and deceit. God wants to be found, and he rewards seekers. Matter of fact, keep your place right there, Hebrews 11.6. Hebrews 11.6. And we're just going to get about halfway through tonight, I think. That's fine. We'll continue next week. Hebrews 11, 6. Whoever wrote this book, I do believe it was Paul, but could be wrong. Whoever wrote this said, But without faith it is impossible to please him, God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. There's two musts here. First, you've got to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. He's not some statue that will take any little offering you want to give. He wants you to diligently seek him. I, I can guess why that is. I don't know exactly why it is, but I can tell you this. He deserves that. He deserves that every second that we diligently seek him. And he doesn't deserve every second that we fall asleep while we're saying we're seeking him. He deserves our entire heart, soul, mind, body, everything. And none of that is wasted. These men here, they were so excited when they saw the star again. Again, as for all we know, unbelievers. They're so excited, they see the star, they travel to Bethlehem. And the wise men found the child. By the way, he wasn't in a manger, in a stable, when they found him. He was in a house. He was in a house. Now. Does that mean um, manger scenes are bad? I, don't, I mean, I get the concept. They were, they were all there at one point, okay? I think it's a symbol, but that wasn't actually how it happened. They were already at a house, uh, these wise men, and by the way, we don't even know there was three wise men. Um, we'll show you in a minute why everybody thinks it's three wise men because of the three gifts that they gave. So there must have been three of them, but the Bible doesn't say there was three. The men were excited. They see the star. They come see the child in the house. The star is standing over the house. Pretty obvious. Why it was not drawing a crowd, I really don't know. But what did they get out of that? What did, what did they get out of this whole experience? The guys left their hometown from the east. I mean, it wasn't just down the street. It was across the country. And they traveled very slowly to get where they were going to find the king of the Jews. They stopped in Jerusalem. They inquired where he was at. They find out from, the, from uh, Herod and from the scribes of Pharisees that he's in Bethlehem. They go to Bethlehem. They follow the star over that actual house. And, what, and then they picked up their reward at the town square. No, there was no reward. Why did they do this? They were looking for the king of the Jews. And I think, I think they were looking for something more. They were looking for something more. And I think this is evident by what they brought. By what they brought. Here's what they brought into the house, bowed down, worshipped the child. They brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Very interesting why they brought these three combinations. Gold was an exclusive treasure of kings. It wasn't mean that nobody ever had gold if they weren't a king, but this was exclusively the treasure of kings. It was known for royalty. They brought gold. Number two, they brought frankincense. Frankincense was an incense. Uh, it created a smell used for worship, representing possibly deity, that they believed who this was. And lastly, to me, this is very puzzling and telling, they brought myrrh. Myrrh was a spice used to embalm the dead. Just a coincidence, right? Just a coincidence. Number three, and lastly tonight, even evil has a place in God's plan. Even evil has a place in God's plan. Verse number 12. And being warned of God in a dream, we're now talking about the, the I, I, even I say three wise men. <laughs> so, being, the wise men being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt, be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. 
When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. I'm going to prove to you why I think evil has a place in God's plan. I believe it's proved right here in this passage in the next paragraph as well. God here had warned the wise men. After they met Jesus, he warned them not to go back to Herod. So they went a different way. By the way, they didn't have to do that. These men were showing signs that they were seeking something. They're not just there doing a duty. God comes to them and they obey. They obey. After that, after the, God sends them off another way, the Bible says that the angel, possibly the same angel, came and warned Joseph in a dream. And he tells Joseph, the one the wise men just saw in Bethlehem, he tells them to flee to Egypt, run to Egypt. Herod is coming to kill Jesus. Think of that. Herod, the king, was coming to kill a child. To kill a child. This is the evil that they were faced with. And we know in the scriptures God never condones evil. But evil cannot circumvent God's plan. Can't do it. It is not possible. Can't circumvent God's plan. Cannot defeat His promises. And if you get anything out of tonight, get that. Learn an attribute of your God. He is omnipotent. And do not forget that. Omnipotent spans every area and fiber of the universe by the very definition of the word. There is nothing that elevates itself over God's power. There is nothing that has the power to stop God. There is nothing that has the power to stump God. There is nothing that has the ability to surprise God. This is your God. If you're saved in here tonight, this is the one that lives inside of you, in the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And nothing can stop him from doing exactly what he wants to do and land everybody in verse 23 that he shall be called a Nazarene. That's mission right here in this chapter. So that Jesus would be called a Nazarene. What do you mean God can't stop? What do you mean that's his mission? Well, here's how I know it's his mission. Because we're going to see, and I don't have time for them all tonight, we've already read one prophecy 700 years earlier. Here's another one 723 years earlier that God told to Hosea. It says, when Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Matthew tells us that prophecy is speaking about what's happening right now, where God told Mary and Joseph to take Jesus to Egypt to fulfill this prophecy. Now, an unbeliever would say, well, they wrote that in the New Testament because they read the Old Testament. <laughs> that's, that's what they say. Not so. Not so. This is written in the New Testament because that was God's plan all along. That was God's all plan. Nothing else could have happened. Now, maybe a different route could have happened, but it had to land on that spot because that's where God said it was going to land. <laughs> it had to happen that way because that's what God said it was going to happen. Even if an evil man trying to kill Jesus Christ and destroy children was the one that made that happen. Think of that one. Even if we live in a country filled with all sorts of perversion and wickedness, just wait. God's plan has not been stopped. God's mission has not been defeated. Has, has not. It's not possible. Even here, it's still happening. God is going on with his mission. The angel warns Joseph in a dream to run to Egypt. Joseph did. He leaves that night. Again, Joseph here is proving why God chose him. You'll notice this about Joseph. He obeyed all the time. But he wasn't perfect. And unfortunately, we won't get to that spot till tonight, or till, till next, next week, at, at the end of chapter, chapter 2. He wasn't perfect, but he was obedient. In verse number two, uh, chapter 2, verse 16, we continue on there. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth. Oh, yeah, he was ticked. <laughs> he was ticked. And sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. And all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men, then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, In Ramah was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, great mourning, 
Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. What a tragedy. Thousands of children, two and older, two and older violently murdered to keep Jesus, the King of the Jews, from coming on the throne, which he wasn't going to be able to do. But this was a wicked man's attempt to do that. And it was all part of God's plan. Not to be confused with condoned by God. It all fit right into God's plan. No surprise there. Matter of fact, God told us 600 years previous to this, 800, oh, see, 2,600 years previous to us now, in Jeremiah 31, 15, he says, Thus saith the Lord, a voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rahel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Jeremiah prophesied that this would come. God told us ahead of time this would come. It was all part of his plan. This fulfilled what God had already foretold. What did this mean to the Hebrew? If you're a little confused what that statement even means, well, Rahel, Rachel, was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. As we know, Rachel and Leah, Jacob's wives. She was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin. Well, the tribe of Benjamin, uh, they had a town, and that town's name was Rama. It is, it is not on all of the maps, but I did find on one in, in my Bible, it's in a map. The second map I tried didn't, didn't have that, and we s skipped the other map that I had on there, that's fine. But if you look on some Bible maps, I'm not sure why it's on some and others, but Ramah is about six miles north of Jerusalem, about 11 miles north of Bethlehem. It is a town of Benjamin. It is a town of Benjamin. Hebrews, Israelites were really big on family lineage. And so, yeah, unfortunately on this map, if you can even see it, it is not uh, listed on there. But if you see the square where Jerusalem is, just north of that by Sipras, Jericho's to the right. Right in that region is where Ramah is. It's a real town. This was prophesied 2,800 years ago that this would happen. And as hard as it is to imagine, well, if God knew that atrocity was going to happen, why didn't he stop it? People say that now, right? Why does God let evil things happen? Why doesn't God just take all evil out of the world? If God really loves us, why doesn't he do that? The same reason he allows each and every one of us to reject him if we want. And that to me is unfathomable. If I was God, and be glad I'm not, if I was God, I would probably make everybody robots and do everything I said. But God doesn't do that. He wants, he wants love and he wants glory from people that choose to do so. Amen. That choose to do so. I believe it's because he's good. You could spend a few eons trying to figure out why God does everything he does. But I can tell you it's all out of his goodness. It's all out of his goodness. And don't think for a second because evil reigns, seems to reign in certain parts of the world, that God has been defeated or God's plan is circumvented somehow. It wasn't back then, and it's not now. This is all part of the master plan of God. Evil will be there. Evil will have its victories, if we want to call it that. Because sin brings death. Sin brings death, and it will continue to do that until God crushes it, finally. God's plan. Unbelievers are a part of his plan. Rewarding seekers is a part of God's plan, and even evil is a part of God's plan. Even evil. As hard as that is to imagine, our sovereign God, let this encourage you tonight to trust him no matter what you encounter, no matter who you encounter, no matter what they say. Have an undeniable, undefeatable faith in our God, in what he does, even when you don't have Matthew chapter 2 sitting in front of you to see 2,000 years later what he did. Because they didn't have that. They were living in it. All they had was a verse back in Hosea or a verse in Jeremiah. And not of them, all of them even had that. But they believed and they obeyed. And we get to read the story. Maybe God will let you see the end, the end of the Lord, as uh, I think Job is the one that says that. Uh, 
Maybe he'll let you see the end of the Lord or his plan or his way in, in something that you're going through. Maybe he won't. Job never saw what he did and why he did. He never did. We, we see it. We're more privileged than he was in that sense. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. But it does not change who God is. Hold to him. Hold to him. If he only lets you see tomorrow, then be okay with that. If you come to something next week that you thought would never be possible, search for him and follow him. God has a plan. God has a plan. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for teaching us tonight. Lord, we'll continue looking at your plan again next week. And Father, it's just been such a joy to study this. And I pray that as you are shaping our minds and our hearts, Lord, my prayer would be, make us more like you. Lord, as you reveal yourself to us, I pray this would begin to filter down to the details in our life. It would not just affect an intellectual understanding of God, but Lord, as we seek to follow you, and as you promise to reward us, and you do, those who follow you, Lord, we would be rewarded with a relationship. Lord, we would be rewarded with Christ-likeness. We would be rewarded, Lord, with the fruits of the Spirit. Father, those are the treasures. This earth claims to have treasures, Lord, but they pale in comparison to knowing you. Lord, would you, would you make that more in our lives than just church talk? Would you make that real for us tonight? Help us, Lord, to fall in line with your purpose and to be okay when we can't see your purpose, Lord, but to look for you, to look for you. Father, we love you tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for encouraging us. In your name I ask, amen.